discussion. First thing I want to say is we're going to tape this event, so you need to know that. In other words, it's on the record. Um, before we start, I want to introduce John Berger, who is um, the editor of these <laughs> these books. Can you imagine what they looked like before he edited them? <laughs> so um, but who's really beloved here at the center? Who edited? Who's edited a number of books of? Um, mine and Joshua's, and um, has just been one of the people who, uh, from Cambridge Press, who has made sure that our students and the world at large will have the information we need, or they need, to put together what happened during the War on Terror legally, and legally in the biggest sense, not just by what was in legal documents or in, in legislative documents easily, even, but what actually happened. What went on outside the courtrooms? What, what, what went on inside the halls of power about the law? And so I just want to acknowledge him. So thank you. <laughs> and then, and, okay. and so if anything goes wrong today. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so um, Rick Abel's book, books are the books we're going to be talking about today. Let me give you a brief introduction. He is the Michael J. Connell Distinguished Professor of Law Emeritus at UCLA School of Law. He's also a distinguished research professor um, and has been the faculty coordinator for the Public Interest Law Program. Now, I don't know how you did all that and wrote these books. I did them all at the same time. Okay, still, it's a lot. But I, but I do want to say that for people who are in this field, whatever we call this field that's been growing up for the past two decades, um, your work has been pivotal. Not just not in these books, which we haven't absorbed yet, but in, in many, many volumes and articles where you have, and leadership positions, where you have laid out this field of law and society and how to think about it, some of the questions. So um, we're going to push you today to sort of talk about all of it um, to get us started. But also with us today are Joshua Dreytel, who's my longtime partner, um, uh, co-editing many things um, about the war on terror and the legal system and its strengths and failures when it comes to uh, national security, terrorism, and related things. Next to him is uh, um, Ramsey Kassem, who is um, now at CUNY. But I want to talk a little bit about Ramsey's work. Um, he's at CUNY um, Law School. But um, he runs a clinic, which is the Immigration and Non-Citizen Rights uh, Clinic. But Ramsey's worked on all different kinds of cases, as has Joshua, to some extent. Ramsey's worked on military commissions. He's worked in the um, federal uh, terrorism trial cases. He's worked on a number of the detainee cases that are not military commissions cases, and I don't think ever will be military commissions cases. And so he kind of um, stands at the intersection of so much of where, what we're going to talk about today. So hopefully that's going to prove interesting. And finally, uh, Martha Rayner who is my colleague here at Fordham uh, Law School. She co-directs the Criminal Defense Clinic here. And I love when her students show up because they are always, they know more about Guantanamo than just about any, uh, anybody else I talk to. They just, you know, they follow these cases with such a passion and such a care and such a concern. I know they do other things, but that's how they come across my desk. So we are, um, and I, I want to recommend just on this Guantanamo thing, Martha's chapter in uh, Obama's Guantanamo Stories from an Enduring Prison, which is really one of the better pieces um, that you might read. So um, we're gonna. This, this is gonna go like this. I'm gonna start and talk to Rick for a couple of minutes, and then I'm gonna try to moderate a conversation among all of you about the book, where it stands, some of its conclusions, and <clears throat> Rick also wants to talk about current events. So somehow we're gonna get all that done very quickly. Um, so Rick, let me just. I want to ask you a question about the shape of things, um, which is that you know you give us this encyclopedia a cyclopedic overview of what's, in, in, depending on which volume you're looking at, of what's happened inside the court system, but also inside the, the legal mindset um, and, and the legal policy world. And what I really want to know is where we've come. You know, we, we always read about the pendulum swing. We've come here, and the pendulum's going to swing back, and oh, yes, the United States makes, you know, mistakes every now and then, but then we get out of a period of, of crisis and and danger, and we, we roll back the clock, and we reestablish ourselves on the firm ground that we all acknowledge as the firm ground. 
We've been in this conversation for a very long time. You know, this center has been around for 16 years, and there's many other centers like it. Um, it doesn't feel like we're about to close our doors, you know, anytime soon. Um, and yet, we're still working on the same issues. So my question is to you is, and I know you addressed some of this, but I, I kind of want to pull this out. Um, what is the shape of this? Where have we gotten? Are we in the middle of the story? Are we at the end of the story? Are we, have we established a new plateau? Um, what are your thoughts? Either one. Either one. So, um, I think it's, it, it's going to take a longer time than we would like to like to believe. I think that when nations commit wrongs of this magnitude over a long period of time, now almost 20 years, it takes a long time before it is prepared to acknowledge the wrongs of its own. In the last chapter of the second book, they're not, they're not chronological, but the last chapter of Law's Trials, I, I addressed this issue because I was concerned that anybody who read even part of the books, much less much of the books, would come away very depressed because of where we are um, after so many people have tried to force the culprits, the perpetrators of these wrongs to acknowledge them and to come to terms with them. And in that last chapter, I looked at a wide variety of wrongs, including genocides and war crimes and racial and gender discrimination and sexual abuse and sexual harassment, you, you name it, there, there are 20 or 30 or 40 different categories. And without trying to make, a, make the claim that I can demonstrate this by the scientific canons of sociology, I would nevertheless argue that these typically took a generation or more. That is, the principal wrongdoers have to leave the scene either because they're age out and they retire when they die, and even typically their immediate successors have to because they are the group that has covered up for them and protected them. And after roughly 30 years, give or take some period of time, corrections start to happen. I'll just give you two examples. The most, the most obvious one, I think, is the, what the length of time it's taken the Catholic Church to address the law and that its priests and, and superiors made over time, which is just now beginning to happen. But another very dramatic incident is the fact that the new uh, president of Spain has exhumed Francisco Franco from his grave and removed him as a place where proto-fascists can come and make up. This is long, a long time coming. The Spanish Civil War was in the late 1930s, so we're now talking almost 90 years later. But it's happening. So my point is, is not to despair, but to, to recognize that patience is, is part of it. Um, is that responsive to your question? Well, I can't, I can't decide if it's um, optimistic or pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> because we're all getting older. I don't have that much patience. So I just, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I'm curious. I want to talk a little bit about how you separated these books. And I know, theoretically, how, how you separated them. But in your mind, were you really working on two separate themes? Or do you think that the same themes kept coming back and back and back? You know, I, I gave a talk at, to my college at UCLA, and somebody said, so Rick, what was your method? And I thought, method? I didn't have a method. I just blundered through it. And my method was, well, I'll give, I'll give you the backstory. So um, on May 2nd, 2004, I was driving back from Grand Canyon to Los Angeles. Um, and it's a very long drive. It's a very dull drive on I-10 uh, through the desert. But you can get NPR any place in the United States. And this was weekend edition. Sunday. So I turned it on. And that was the, that was the moment Cy Hirsch broke up a grave. And it riveted me, as it riveted millions and millions of people. But it had a special resonance for me for two reasons. First of all, and this is shameless name dropping, he's my brother-in-law. And I've known Cy for 50 plus years. And I was there when he broke um, uh, me live. So it was a, a reiteration of that. Um, he's an impossible but a great person. And I was I felt called upon to address it for that reason. And the other was that my previous book, or several books back, was about South Africa. And it was about the efforts of law and lawyers to address apartheid. And that was a success story. It was an extraordinary success story in a 
in an environment where I thought it would not happen. So I, I thought my other projects had basically wound up. I would devote myself to this. And basically from 2004 until I gave the manuscript to John last year, um, I worked on this pretty much full time because I retired in 2003. <coughs> so uh, what, how did it take the shape it did? I just took notes of everything that's taught me it's relevant for years and years. And then I thought to myself, Maybe it's time to think of what the categories are. What is underlying your sense of relevance? And so I came up with 50 or 60 categories. And then I realized even for two books, that was going to be too much. And so I went up them down. Um, and the, the shape they take now is, was very late in coming. Um, and if, if it has a clear organizational principle, it is. Where, where, where were the major battlegrounds in, in people who were trying to preserve the rule of law during the war on terror. And they were Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, torture interrogation. We now know that interrogation can also lead to killing in Saudi Arabia. Torture interrogation, electronic surveillance. And then what I call the battlefield, which is a, a broad concept which maybe doesn't in fact unite all its components. So it includes extraordinary renditions, secret prisons, targeted killing, and then all the civilian casualties. So those were, the, those were the areas where I thought the contest, the, the, the forces of good and evil were going. And then the second was easier to organize, because it was the principal fora in which the legal issues got, got raised. So it was habeas corpus, criminal prosecutions, military commission trials, uh, courts martial, civil damages actions, and civil liberties cases. And there's obviously overlap in all of those, but that organization is neither in some ways. Um, when I was talking to you earlier today about the relationship between what you're writing in, about in the book and current day issues, um, you know, a lot of these issues have in one way, shape, or form been, and I'm putting quotes around this, resolved, right? Um, or at least they were until recently, the you know, ban on torture, reinstated. Um, the, um, we don't know where the surveillance uh, is going. We don't actually know where the drone uh, targeted killing uh, is going. Um, we don't know where Guantanamo is going. But when I asked you what you thought was in today's headlines that were particularly pertinent to the kinds of things you'd like to think about, you said. Yeah, so thanks for the, the, the yes. self-fold question. I said, I said military commissions. So I could have taken any, any of the topics. And I chose military commissions because the events of the last year really reiterate and underline and magnify, if that's possible, the chaotic, chaotic state of that institution and the hopelessness of the attempt to try these people in that forum by that process. So I thought I'd just bring you up to date in, in five or ten minutes as to what, what has happened during the year as an illustration. And the same could have been done, I think, in the other domains, but this is the one that I, I thought lent itself to that. Okay. So first, why military commissions? And I think we know the answer to that. Courts martial were going to lead to acquittals, and um, there was an attempt by, by Eric Holder to bring the HP, high value detainees to New York, and they didn't lay the political foundation for that, and so that, that failed. Um, and so they, we, we were left with military commissions. Uh, by the way, I was at a, this is an aside, but I was at a fascinating event at UCLA just a couple of days ago, in which the one surviving prosecutor from the Nuremberg war, war crimes trials gave a presentation. He's 99 years old. He's, he's, a, he's an amazing man. And he told me something which I had never heard, and I'm curious as to what other people here know this, that he was, de he was in the military, and he was detailed at the end of the war to basically follow the front as it moved eastward <coughs> and to try the Germans who had been commandants of the concentration camps that they were liberated. And as they reached each, each concentration camp, the Germans were rounded up, they were jailed, and military commissions were held by the hundreds. And there were some summary trials, and there were, they got quick convictions. And I don't know whether the people who, whether the John Hughes of this world who thought, now this is really a great device, look how well it worked for World War II, we can get rid of all these people quickly, we're talking about that. I just don't know how much, how much that's there. Okay, so military commission trials. There are, there are three pending trials, uh, three, three trials in progress. Uh, and correct my pronunciation, because I, is it Al-Nashiri or Al-Nashiri? 
it's, well, people say it two different ways. I say Al-Nashri, other people say al nashiri say whatever you want. Yeah. So, you, Ramsey, how would you say it? You okay. mean? You guys got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so, 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 on, on the shiri you know that listening equipment was found in the meeting rooms in which he and his council had been talking. Um, they had seen it. They couldn't talk to him about it because it was secret, so they couldn't ask whether he could consent to their continued representation under conditions where neither of them knew whether they had been eavesdropped or not. The Chief Defense Counsel, John Baker, declared that he had lost con confidence in client confidentiality, and therefore uh, he allowed, uh, indeed directed, the defense attorneys to, uh, to, to quit. Um, Judge Spath was furious at this. He held Baker's contempt. He sentenced him to the brig. He only served a couple of days there, and he imposed a thousand dollar fine. Turned out the government made, had made secret exchanges, secret tapes, and additional secret tapes of the exchanges between Spath and Baker, and they were going to use these in the contempt proceeding. Baker never knew about this. Um, uh, so Richard Kamen, the only learned counsel, resigned, and so did Rosa Eliades and Mary Spears. Um, uh, Spath had ruled that the attorney general privilege, the attorney, the attorney client privilege, only protects the, the, the client from the entry of communications into evidence. It does not protect their, their um, eavesdropping themselves. Um, the DOD general counsel said he had no authority to order anybody on commission to do anything. Spath then asked defense matters what to do about a rogue, rogue, rogue organization. Baker's replacement, Wayne Aaron, asked Spath for authority to, what, what was his authority to order him to appear? And Spath said, why don't you try refusing and see what happens? Um, which gives you a sense of how the proceedings felt to people who were actually participating in them. And he also berated defense counsel for their attire. I know what that says, but little respect you have for the commission is obvious. A short sleeve shirt, no tie, no coat, I get it. I held a general officer in contempt. That should have stood out, obviously threatening them with the same thing. That left uh, Lieutenant Piet, a recent law graduate, a sole defense lawyer. He refused to proceed. Uh, the director of the ABA, and again, you all know this because some of this was, actually happened here, um, of the ABA, ABA Death Penalty Representation Project testified that learned counsel was mandatory. Judge Spath said, no, he didn't think so. The ABA didn't really know what he was talking about. Um, he ordered convening authority of Harvey Rishkoff to mobilize Brian Leiser, who had been an earlier defense attorney, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that was done, and Leiser is apparently back now um, in, in the case. The defense sought review in the uh, Court of Military Commission review, and the prosecution finally declassified the record showing the defense lawyers had found a microphone in the special client meeting room. Um, they claimed it was not operational, but of course they offered no evidence for that. Uh, judge Lambert, who was an extremely conservative judge in the D.C. District Court, um, overturned Baker's contempt citation, finding that the Spath lacked authority. Only commission members could hold, could cite for contempt, and none had been impaneled. So you, again, you have a totally chaotic process. At that point, Spath abated the proceedings. He said that he accused the defense organization of being intent on stopping the system. What they're doing is engaging in revolution to the system. I'm not ordering the Third Reich to engage in genocide. This isn't belie, not war crimes, people. He refused to dismiss the case, which would reward the defense for clear misbehavior and misconduct. The prosecution appealed the, the abatement. Piet said the CMCR lacked jurisdiction. It denied a motion by Eliades and Spears to intervene. When they sought a writ of mandamus, the DC Circuit granted their motion for a stay and ordered the government to give them classified clothing. But when the prosecution conceded that they could participate, the DC Circuit dismissed, it, uh, dismissed um, uh, the, the appeal. And as Karen has just mentioned, the CMCR just ordered the defense lawyers to participate, declared that Baker lacked the authority to dismiss them, and overturned the debate. So presumably the case is back in, in operation, although under extraordinary circumstances. Lambert overturned Baker's contempt citation. Um, and then Spath announced his retirement, presumably <coughs> serious at, at this, at this conduct. And then, just three weeks ago, 
three or four weeks ago, he appeared in a photo next to Attorney General Sessions as one of a group of new uh, immigration judges. Clearly, this process had been in, 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 in train for months and months, if not for more than a year, while he was handling the case. Uh, and the new lawyers asked the Court of Appeals for Military Commission to review to throw out all of Spatz's rulings. And he's been replaced by a judge with just four years' experience. I think for purposes of time, I could say something similar about the other two cases. But I'll just, I'll just stop there and just say, you have three cases with three brand new judges with very little experience as judges and very little experience as lawyers. And in a sense, we're back to ground to, 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 to the starting point. The trials aren't going to start for years. And even if they ever reach a verdict, there are mandatory appeals. Uh, I, I can't imagine a final outcome for all of this in less than 10, 10 to 20 years. And just the last footnote, on the basis of all of that, the prosecution decided now it's time to start three new proceedings. There are three new military commission cases just, just started. So I want to turn first to, to Martha and Ramsey. Um, and so you answered my question, what is the shape of this? The shape of this is just a never-ending circle that doesn't pro progress and doesn't really regress because there's no place to regress to. Um, not to mention, by the way, that there's a new um, uh, judge for the 9-11 um, case. Yes. Who's already okay. announced that he's only going to be there for a year or whatever, so, which we know the case is. But, so, so Martha, let me start with you. Just in ter These are all things you're very familiar with, but in terms of how, um, I mean, I look at what's happening with the military commissions now, and, and, and I, I agree with you. I don't think it's just back to ground zero. It never got off the ground. And the same thing with the, with the habeas cases, essentially. Um, do you think there's been any progress at Guantanamo and more? And I want you both to answer it. Do you think there's ever, ever in, any intention of there being progress? Progress meaning closing Guantanamo? I mean trying or, yes, I mean not having people stay there for the rest of their lives. Well, so I think there were almost 800 men there who have passed through Guantanamo and there's 40 who remain. Have we solved the core issues of Guantanamo? No. But have many men been repatriated and some of them sent to third countries? Yes. Um, so I, I need to cling to that reality to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, what progress will be made from here? I think is extremely difficult to, and by the way, I, I, I think there's been, the military commissions are a complete disaster. I don't think there's, there's been any progress made there, and I agree with Rick, <coughs> those trials have been for a very long time. Um, it's a complete disaster. I think it's a great example of what you talk about, Rick, in the rule of law, where really the, the commissions were designed to avoid the rule of law, and they, they're unsuccessful, I think, because they tried to keep away from civilian, the civilian criminal justice system, in which actually the rule of law is actually quite entrenched. And not that it, oh, it works perfectly, because it certainly doesn't, and not that we haven't seen civilian prosecutions in which the rule of law has been bent, um, but not nearly like it's been bent and almost broken in the military commissions. And I think that's a lesson in that when the law really is entrenched, like it is in the civilian criminal justice system, it's better able to resist all the forces that you talk about in your book. Um, the military commission can't do that, right? Because it has no bones, right? It has really no structure. It is totally at the whims of, po of politics. Um, and so I think it, it really will never work. Um, but progress, <laughs> I mean, I think it is politics. It's always been politics, um, and I think we're going to have to wait for the next administration. Oh my God! Um, the um, the um, you know I just want to remind people that that Obama halted the military commissions initially while they figured out on their different task forces, and then the result of the task force that was looking at you know the, all of the cases was to revive the military commissions, albeit with some changes, but still. You know, I just worry that that would happen again, you know, Military Commissions Act of whatever. Um, <clears throat> Ramsey, um, I, I want to turn to you and, and move a little bit towards what the, um, I mean, you can weigh in on the military commissions for sure, but the notion of where law fits now at Guantanamo. 
you know, dealing with the, the population generally and not just the military commission's population, but both. How, is it, where is the, the role of law in this conversation now? Yeah, I, I want to start by, uh, by thanking you, Karen, for inviting all of us here uh, and including us on the same panel. I'm always happy to be on the panel with Martha. You were remiss not to mention that Martha is the person who gave me my, uh, my first break in this line of work. I started teaching here at Fordham with her back in 2005, I think. Yep. Um, Good choice. <laughs> and, um, so, um, so with that, I mean, I, you know, I think, I mean, I, I would echo everything that Martha said in terms of progress, and, and really your metric is what's going to determine your answer to that question there. So if you define, uh, you know, progress by, by way of formal outcomes, I think even, even through that lens, there is a way to look at the different jurisprudential outcomes and to say, well, you know, the detainees have been victorious at the Supreme Court when you look at you know, Hamdi, Hamdan, Boumediene, and Masul, right? Uh, so even from that kind of like narrow-minded sort of formalistic analysis, there is a way to say that there has been progress jurisprudentially. But, but, but I think that the far more meaningful measure is the one that Martha put forward, which is, you know, we're now, we're now down to 40 prisoners from almost 800. Uh, and that result uh, really flows from the efforts, the combined efforts of number one, the prisoners and their families, supported by their lawyers, supported by you know, human rights NGOs and organizations like yours, and journalists, and I see some in the room. I mean, all of that, as well as uh, you know, foreign governments, brought enough pressure to bear uh, to make the Bush administration release the largest number of prisoners, and the Obama administration to, to release more prisoners. Uh, the courts played a role in that. Um, some, you know, a formal role to some extent. I mean, some prisoners were released as a result of habeas victories, for example, or as a result of military commission dispositions like my client, who, who just got out under the Trump administration, and unfortunately, maybe the last person to get out of uh, Guantanamo under the Trump administration. Uh, but for the most part, it was leveraging the courts to create release pressure, even if it wasn't through formal outcomes, rulings, granting the writ of habeas corpus and the like. Um, so, so I think this goes back to, you know, what your frame is. Right? I mean, and so Rick said something earlier that, uh, you know, I would push back against that, that this is about you know, people who are trying to preserve the rule of law during the war on terror. And, and I know that there are some lawyers who, uh, you know, who are motivated by that. Uh, but I think there are many more. And, and I actually know that a lot of the prisoners would take offense to that sort of frame, um, just like anyone who finds themselves uh, behind bars. I think for them, they want a lawyer to be on their side, not on the side of the rule of law or the Constitution or some other abstraction. Um, and, and, so, and so I think by that measure, really, that's what tells you whether or not you've succeeded, uh, whether the client you're serving, if you are playing a defense role, is satisfied with what you've tried to do on their behalf, whether or not you were able to get them released. Um, as for you know, the rule of law and, and the role of law, you know, I, I look at it as uh, you know, degrees, well, Maybe not degrees, but different kinds of illegitimacy are at play. And so with the military commissions, I think we're all in agreement that there is a fundamental structural illegitimacy that we see in all of the different expressions of the military commission system since the beginning. And, I, and I've litigated you know, under the military commission sort of 1.0, as does Josh, 2.0, 3.0. And so all three versions are you know, fundamentally flawed and, and reflect that structural illegitimacy. But if you turn to the federal court system, and Karen, you know this probably better than anyone, and the way in which the federal court system has processed um, you know, terrorism cases, I think there's arguably a functional illegitimacy at, at, at play there. Uh, and you know, Josh also knows this from the cases that he's handled, I know this from the cases that I've handled. Uh, it plays out in many different ways. The things that prosecutors are permitted to get away with, even in Article Three courts, uh, you know, bespeak that sort of functional illegitimacy. Uh, and so I, I want to problematize like that, that, that dichotomy between uh, you know, military commissions versus Article Three because you know, the Article Three courts um, would not be a friendly place for uh, defendants uh, coming out of Guantanamo. And they haven't. I mean, the Guantanamo case is one, one example. Um, I'm glad you said that because one of the things that you kind of between a catch-22 when you're talking about these things because we so much want to defend the federal courts, you know, they can work, they're better than the military commissions, you should have these cases here, and yet you go to these terrorism trials and you watch what happens and you're just between the uses of secrecy, the, the claims of national security, the, 
the many aberrations that you see, you're sort of, you, you know that you're building up something that has already been um, compromised. And Joshua, you've participated in a few of these, like a few dozen of these cases. Um, but first, I want to, I want you to, I want to go back to something Ramsey said, and then, and then get to this, which is kind of the, and just because I know this is something you've given some thought to because you've had to, you know, not because, yeah. um, which is the way in which the rule of law and how you want to behave in a sort of theoretical context can conflict with what it means to defend an individual. And I know that you, I'm not going to, you know, you could talk about whatever cases you want, but I know that you've had this. And just, if you want to talk about that and then somehow segue to the, the, the problems within the federal court system. And, and by the way, so many of these cases, I don't know, you know, how many of you've had a chance to really read through this, but you know, so many of the cases you've worked on are, are here. And so just to talk a little bit about, about the, how robust is this federal court system for trying terrorism cases, and, and um, is it gonna get any better? And then we'll have your question. Thanks, Karen. Thanks to the center for having us on this panel. Thanks to Professor Abel for extraordinarily impressive treatment of extraordinary information, um, which when I went through it, particularly the trials part, but really both books, I, I, I thought it was some sort of perverse test of how much PTSD I, I could endure <laughs> reading through these accounts of all these cases, um, because it, it it does bring back a lot of what you're talking about, and I'll get into it. But in the context of um, the conflict between the abstract principles and specific representation, uh, I'll just use it for the example that I will use uh, as sort of paradigm is David Hicks, uh, my client in the uh, commissions, one of the original commissions, and the negotiation and resolution of the case through a plea of guilty, the first plea of guilty in the commissions. And there was a tremendous sense of ambivalence about capitulating to a system that we knew was illegitimate and that we firmly believed was illegitimate. And I'll just give you two vignettes that it, it was never really a question of what we were going to do because the client always comes first. You learn that as a criminal defense lawyer regardless and by that time I've been doing it for over 20 years so it's ingrained in, you know, there are a lot of issues. A lot of times, you know, you plead a client guilty with a very, very strong constitutional issue that never gets litigated. Sometimes you lose a motion in the district court and you plead and there's no appeal. So you do this often, but it hits. Um, two things. One is my military co-counsel, Dan Murray, Marine Major, uh, retired from Lieutenant Colonel recently, um, as, and, 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 and Dan said to me, he said, you know, I, I hear you and we'll litigate this and we'll win and the system will be uh, invalidated like it was in Hamdan because we actually played a year after Hamdan and they already reconstituted the commissions, which is like, to me it's like 3.5 or 3.75 and like, they're always doing some tinkering with it through all the Military Commission Act and the Detainee Act, uh, Detainee Treatment Act. But um, they said, you know, we'll do that, and we'll win in the Supreme Court, and then they'll reconstitute the commission, and we'll be back here again to fight it through, and then we'll go to the Supreme Court, we'll win it again, and all that time will take about five, six, seven years, and David will still be here. And then the other was just telling David's family what the offer was, which was that he could be home in Australia in 60 days, and their reaction, it made it much easier in that context. Um, but at the same time, you know, even David had uh, ambivalence, and I think his family was very important in moving him, not, not that difficult, but, but certainly moving him um, in that direction to abandon what was at that time a five, four or five year fight at that point. And uh, so that was difficult, and you. You know, I think in the context of the commissions and the, and, and, and Ramsey's you know, right on point with the, the conf, you know, you, when you compare the commissions to the federal courts, it, it's, it's, there's always been a struggle in the community of, of sort of this, 
policy question than the questions of representing actual people and what the dispositions are. You know, I, I think Guantanamo, and I used to say this a lot, but I haven't said much since 2009 because of the profound disappointment of the retrenchment during the Obama administration after the initial potential for closure. Um, and uh, which is that Guantanamo is by far the most successful litigation program in history. And for the numbers that Martha and Ramsey, and you look at the, and the number of negative dispositions or adverse dispositions, it's, 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 it's negligible in that regard. Unfortunately, people are still there, people who should be released, um, people who will never be tried, uh, people who will never have process. But at the same time, when you look at the numbers, and when I first started in the fall of 2003, there were really just about those 800 there. And the first large Afghan releases were happening just around that time. So it's really quite extraordinary. Unfortunately, we haven't made much progress in, in eight years, and, and now who knows what's going to happen after that. But in the context of the, the criminal trials and the criminal process in the, in the federal courts, and I, I, I reflect on the questions that Professor Abel. You better call me. Rick. Okay, Rick. Okay. So anyway, um, Rick poses a series of questions, and they're they're not simple questions, and they have a lot of compound and complex answers to them about how this process has evolved through the courts. And my my response, to a certain extent, is that. 9-11, obviously, is where you have to start for, the, for these books. Otherwise, it's, it's, it takes an unwieldy project and makes it impossible. But for me, having done a FISA case in 1982 for the Irish Republican Army, which is the founding FISA case that led to all the FISA laws, Duke and D-U-G-G-A-N, it, it is the Second Circuit case that is the template for all FISA decisions. And then 98, the, the embassy bombings case, a lot of this was in place in a certain way, but everybody thought it was a one-off. No one really thought that this was going to be an ingrained part of the system that would dominate an entire field of prosecution. And unfortunately, when that happens, and you know, I, I, through the drug war and organized crime and you find that all of these exceptions that are used for special circumstances that are considered social programs, as well, to eradicate a certain type of, of, of threat to society, it becomes, it becomes part of the fabric of, of the criminal law as a whole. And that is a significant problem in the context of these cases. But you know, it's really fundamental, and it's not just about law, it's really about it, it's, it's about attitudes, and the reason I say that is because it is so difficult. And I'll start just really at the most basic. It is just so difficult to find a jury that will handle these cases impartially. These are all referendums on existential security. They're not about whether somebody robbed some place in the Bronx or in Brooklyn or in Manhattan and what happens to that person. This is treated by jurors because the prosecution is allowed to is allowed to present it this way, that this is about a threat to all of you on this jury. And judges treat it that way too with anonymous juries who they know why. There's no anonymous jury in a Sheldon Silver. That's a high profile case you can get. There's no anonymous jury. Everybody knows what it's all about. Ramsey, would you agree with this? That it's impossible to get a jury for a terrorism case? Um, I mean, I think certainly the defendant is a Muslim-identified defendant, and the case is presented as a terrorism case. It's, it's, it's going to be really hard to find a jury anywhere in the United States that will give uh, your client a fair shake. But frankly, I mean, the, the problem might even be upstream from that, right? The problem might even be with, with, with the laws that, that prosecutors tend to rely on in these cases. And so, you know, there's, you know, volumes could be written about the, the deep-seated problems with the two main material support statutes that are used by by prosecutors in these cases. So even in that highly unlikely event where you have a fair judge and where you have a fair jury, um, the playing field is still pretty tilted towards the other side. Yeah, I have a friend who retired. 
retired a few years ago. And I asked him why. Um, and he said, he said, it used to be that the judge would have to, would have to manipulate the law in order to defeat your case. And now it's all within the law. So, you know, the rule of law to me is a little overrated on this level, which is that, you know, Dred Scott was the law, plus E.B. Ferguson was the law, uh, Korematsu was the law. The law's only trying as, to be alive is the law. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the law. That was my other example, right? It, you know, it, 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 those are all the law. Nuremberg laws were the law. And so, what does the rule of law mean if it doesn't involve justice and equity and a lack of discrimination? And I understand the importance of rules, but I also know that these rules, in many respects, are the handcuffs on those of us right. looking for fair trials. Thank you, Hatton. Mm -hmm. Respond? Well, yeah, I mean, because I, in some ways, it's a very bizarre position for me to be in defending the rule of law um, uh, to, in, in the light of a text on, on my left, because <laughs> literally and figuratively, <coughs> because I was a founding member of Critical Legal Studies 30 years ago, and uh, the main thrust of Critical Legal Studies was the in inability to separate law from politics and the uh, insistence that there could be no rule of law. And so the question is, why have I changed position? Is it just aging and uh, lack of revolutionary fervor? I, I don't think that's what it is. I think it is that in writing these books, uh, especially in light of my experience in South Africa, I saw the rule of law as a resource or an ally that could be invoked precisely because it does, to some extent, transcend the other divisions in society. Um, I, I found it really quite striking that you would find judges who were conservative in all other respects, but often because they had, had military service, they were very hostile to the attempt to bypass the rule of law because they were used to bureaucracies that operated uh, according to rules. Uh, the, the rule of law is not the law on the books. Uh, that's, that's positive law, and, and that has to be tested against uh, other and higher principles. And uh, the rule of law, for me, is simply uh, an amalgam, a composite of the sort of lowest common denominator on which a wide swath of the population can agree. And it's that agreement that I think we need. I, I certainly agree with you about the criticism of, of uh, many of the criminal prosecutions. Whenever possible, there was a reference to the 9 11 attacks, even if it was entirely irrelevant to the case. And, that, and judges would allow that. And of course, that's way too easy. At the same time, I was surprised, and I, I, I defer to the three practitioners on, on the panel who have much more experience than I. I was surprised by the fact that there were a, a number of hung juries in which there was typically one token. Um, somebody who said, look, they just haven't proved it the other reasonable doubt, and I haven't reasonable doubt, and I refuse to go along with it. The, the uh, Liberty City case in, in Florida is the best example. They had to try that case three times before they could get juries to agree. So the end, the end is they could get a jury to agree, but there were individuals who said it, it, doesn't, it doesn't pass the smell test. Well, what you could say, even if it is true that they've been some, you know, juries, and um, um, is that um, if you, if you're the defendant, it is a very strong argument that your risk of going to trial is very high. Um, and so, whether or not you could find a holdout on a jury, the overall, you know, takeaway may be other. Why do you look like you have a? Yeah. So, <laughs> I would ask you a question, Rick, because. Um, you know, you, you do, you certainly, you're advancing the rule of law here, and you're, you're, you're saying that it had a role in all this, and perhaps prevented us from falling more off than we did during these last few decades. Um, but yet, you say that, the, you know, habeas did very little, and the lawyers did very little in the, in the overall scheme of, and I just kind of am wondering why you reached that conclusion. I, I would never say the lawyers did very little. The lawyers did magnificent work. The lawyers were achieved very little. Um, I mean, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, again, I defer to, to those of you who have been in the trenches, but the number of people who were released from Guantanamo as a, as a direct result of a habeas war, how many are there? Well, I think it was. 
was it was a low compared to the number that were released, right? But as Ramsey said in his introductory remarks, right, the lawyers were the one that op that opened up Guantanamo, right? And were allowed to bring in some information <coughs> out, right? Give it to NGOs, provide it to the media, right? And 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 uh, and bring some of their their lawyer their client stories, right, to the to the to the wider uh, world. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and all that was used, right, by activists and all those players, right, to build the political pressure that did, I think, have a lot to do with the number of men who went home, going home. Well, so let me, let me play devil's advocate, but you've got to take it as, as a given that I enormously value your work. You know, I'll take it personally. The devil's advocate <laughs> position would be, um, none of these people shouldn't have been there. We, know, we all know that. And the administration realized that. It wasn't a sense of guilt. It was a sense of pointlessness, that they had no information. They, were, they didn't pose a threat, so why keep them? Well, I, I do think that what, I, I think what really troubles me, I mean, there's so much that troubles me, but one of the things, right, so, Josh, you say that there was sort of this, you know, the, the Guantanamo project, the legal project, was this great victory, right? But I actually see it as, yes, because men were released, right, I get that. But I actually think it's, it's been a profound failure in the sense that we, you know, we created an indefinite, detention system, right? That is the law, as we say. Right? These men, the U.S. is permitted to hold these men indefinitely until the end of hostilities, right? An issue that Romsey has litigated tooth and nail recently, right? And the courts have said so far, and it's not looking good that that will change, is when we say indefinite, we mean indefinite. It will go on forever, right? That's the law we've created. Yeah, and the, and the, and the people that got out, 500 plus with um, with Bush, and then got out because of some you know made up process. And basically, you have a president that says whether you stay in or whether you go out, however he outsources it. So the lack of procedural, you know, so I, you know, so just to, to weigh in here, even though I didn't have to do any of the work. Um, yeah, I mean, my impression was Guantanamo, from my experience, were. And this is during that period where so many people were being released, and it was no screening in, no screening out um, in, in many respects. And and from my perspective, in terms of the Hicks case, going in there with the objective of getting them out, um, and with the <coughs> strategy that he would get out when it became more painful for the Australian government to have him there than to have him home. Uh, was purely a political one. I must tell you that we use the we have we have litigation on four continents. You know, we had Australia, we had UK, we had Cuba, we had we had Washington. So we had litigation going in, in all four places, purely for purposes of creating political leverage that would get him released. And all the people who were released were released because of politics. They were released because the countries have relationships with the U.S., like Western European countries that refused to to abide by their, or their Saudis or Kuwaitis, uh, and there were alliances that had to be, and the poor guys from, you know, places like Yemen with no political leverage are still there. So to me, it's a lot of, it, and, and, and I think that's, you know, obviously part of what's reflected in the, in the criminal process too, although not as much, and, and, and you know, Ricky, you asked those questions about what motivates judges in particular. And I think it's 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 not really it's not really like who, who appoints them on the politics, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of collegial politics that goes on about you know what you're doing in the context of your court and what the norms are. And unfortunately, uh, they were built on some very very difficult cases that have that, that, that nobody distinguishes the cases that aren't. Like um, we're going to turn to something very concretely. I, you know, I, um, so since since I started doing this with Martha in 2005, um, my students and I have represented 14 prisoners in Guantanamo and one of them. Um, and we now have, um, of those original 14, two remain in Guantanamo plus a third new client that we just become recently. But I, I can say that for the ones that that have gotten released while we represented them, um, with the exception of two, uh, I can say with a fair degree of certainty that 
none of them would have gotten out when they got out had it not been for our efforts. And I can point you specifically to what we did in those cases to precipitate that outcome. And we got, my students and I have gotten these men released in every imaginable way. So it could have been through the federal court system with you know, sort of litigating to force the government to produce a factual return to justify someone's imprisonment when they didn't want to do that. And once the, ju the judge granted our motion over the government's objection, the government mooted out the case by releasing that man. Now, so in that kind of case, we don't have the formal grant of habeas corpus. But you know, I think that's coming out through the process, or it could be setting a trial date again over the government's opposition. It could be sort of leveraging the periodic review board system in combination with uh, you know, diplomatic advocacy with foreign governments to get somebody cleared and make sure that there's a third country to receive them as a refugee. So we've deployed literally every possible um, you know, method or power and used every pathway available to get to that outcome. Um, it could even be you know, petitioning for cert and, uh, and having the government release our client from Bagram while that cert petition was pending to avoid having the case uh, adjudicated, right? So that, that's a way of, again, leveraging the formal mechanisms to arrive at the desired outcome defined by the client, primarily, and not by reference to uh, sort of um, some abstract commitment to uphold the rule of law. Interesting. Time for your questions. We're going to take questions serially and then answer them. So in the front row and then in the second row. Uh, Rick, uh, please t share with us uh, what uh, book are you working on now, if any? I'm just wondering, hi, for Jessica Wardia. Uh, I'm just wondering, you started out by noting that this uh, judge in the commissions has been replaced with someone who is new to being a judge and new to the law in general. And it seems to me that you said that because it mattered, but you never quite brought out why it mattered. And I'm very interested in what you would say about how being new to the law would affect all of these issues about rule of law and, and addressing the commissions in general. Take those two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I guess. Well, I really have to write another book. Um, I, I, have, I have another project, uh, but. But this is, this is my capstone. I'm not really planning to go on with this. Other people can, can take it up. People said, uh, well, you wrote about the Bush and Obama administration. Surely you're going to write about the Trump administration. The answer is no. It's a wholly different animal. And there are plenty of people out there who are eager, eager to write about that. Um, hi, Francesca. Um, uh, why is it important that the judge is new? I think the importance is that new judges are at least going to make different kinds of mistakes from old judges and I would guess more of them, because they just don't know what is and is not a mistake. So I think the process, and, and we were just told, they're going to turn over as well, because they're not, they're not, who ever heard of a criminal case in which the judge changes every few months? I mean, in the federal system, it would be unthinkable. You, so. Yeah, we have a few. That's why the case is wrong, too. <laughs> yes. um, so I, I, I do think that, that it will inject even further uncertainty and confusion. That's, that's and part of that is because, and this has been reflected in the commission at the outset from the original hearings in August of 2004 and beyond, which is that a judge coming in does not have an, a, a very strong template of prior experience to do commission work because things come up that are different, and the rules are different, and nobody knows how to handle them. And so as a result, chaos is always lurking around the next corner. And, and, and judges who are less experienced, I think, are less able to handle those well. And at the same time, uh, just, just have left, uh, also have less a sense of, um, of comfort in their own authority that sometimes is beneficial for navigating these things. But that's all good. So Not to mention, 
familiarity with the documents, but we won't go there. Yeah, and it's, I mean, from a defense perspective, it's good, particularly the capital case, right? Sure. But, yeah. but, you know, just keep in mind, it's also the logistics. I mean, the logistics of, you know, like, Martha or I getting to Guantanamo, for example, to see our clients. I, you know, I was there a few weeks ago, and Martha's going next week. <coughs> it, that's not at all easy or obvious. And the same applies for the military commissions. So, you know, this judge comes in, he's brand new, um, in his courts martial practice, if something unexpected happens in court, and it will never involve classified information, because there's never any classified information in your average court martial case. So that already is a completely new animal to these military judges who have just been brought in from the UCMJ system and parachuted into the military commission system. Uh, so they're already grappling with that. But in their normal court, on their base, wherever they sit, something unexpected happens, they can adjourn until the next day. Or they can give the parties four or five days or a week, and the parties can then come back. Something unexpected happens in Guantanamo. Uh, the military judge doesn't have that luxury of adjourning for a couple of days because the flight schedules are set in a way where the, the entire operation is being moved back and forth uh, between Cuba and Virginia on a weekly basis. And you can't move those flights because that requires you know, crazy logistics involving DOD's uh, you know, carrier arm. Uh, they, they, they just can't, I mean, it's like they can't turn around those ships on a dime. Um, and so things like that end up costing a lot of time. And that time accrues. And if you have experience in the process, then you're aware of that, and maybe you can manage it a bit better, just like Judge Pohl, who'd been in the military commissions for a very long time by, by the time he retired. But someone new uh, is going to fall right into those pitfalls. You know, this really raises the question of law school and law school students, because you have your students that are being, you know, helping and learning about this system, which isn't exactly a system, but it is. And so, I mean, one of the things, and I'm just curious how all of you think about this, is how much of this should we be teaching our students? Um, I know I bring this up with my students all the time. Like, it's just, do you ever think about that? Like, we're teaching them something that's an aberration, that we kind of hope doesn't go on, that's become a body of law in and of itself, but it's sort of outside, dare I say, the rule of law as we know it. Do you have any qualms about, well, I mean, arguably, it's what we should be teaching. It's one of the most important areas of law I think we should be focusing on right now. Um, I mean, it's, it's not an aberration, actually, right? That's what's really unfortunate about it. It has become an entire area of law. But we didn't really used to have national no. security law classes, right? No. Um, I mean, I, I know, you know, we, we, you know Ramsey and I took on this, this work. I took on this work initially because um, there was a call from the Center for Constitutional Rights for volunteer lawyers, and they mentioned the word habeas, and I thought, I know, I know something about habeas, and I know how to represent men that are locked up. And I, you know, I you know, fell down a rabbit hole that looked nothing like I had ever seen before, um, until the day I actually met my client, um, and, he was a client who was locked up. But after that, right, the similarities of anything I had ever known to the criminal defense law um, really fell, fell away. But what's kind of scary in a certain way is the way over these many years it has become normalized, right? And that's what's very concerning to me, right? Because in the, in the, in the beginning of all this, right, the horror, right, the outrage, the, the you know, well, the aberration of all this, right? And now it's normalized, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Josh? My contracts professor had an odd way of teaching in terms of every, as a, as a distinction from all the other professors, is he would give us two decisions on the same issue, essentially, irreconcilable from two different courts. And it was kind of difficult to understand what he was trying to get at. Because I would ask, and there really would never be a satisfactory answer. And it wasn't until I was practicing a few years that I realized what a gift that was, because that is really what happens in practice, is that there is not a, despite what they teach you in law school, in virtually every class, there is not a common thread of precedent that flows from one to the other. There are tangents, there are, irreconcil there are irre irreconcilable cases all the time. And as a lawyer, you just have to marshal them in a way that you hope is more compelling than the other side. And kind of what I learned early on in doing research is, you know, I can find a proposition 
a legal proposition virtually for anything. It's really, what are the facts that I can analogize to my case that make that legal proposition applicable? So I think it's, I think it's a great thing to teach students because it, it reflects much more what really happens in courtrooms and in the legal profession than some fantasy that this is a series of precedents that flow logically from one to the other for 250 years. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask the practitioners at the panel what they thought. It goes to your question, Karen, about whether or not we should be teaching this and um, whether or not it is an aberration. Um, how have you seen some of the imprimaturs of the national security law expand in the regular criminal justice system? I mean, have you seen the volume of cases that deal with FISA and, and, and CEBA, for example, expand? And, and to what extent has that happened? And are you worried about that going forward? I mean, maybe not just FISA and CEPA, but other uh, sort of special aspects of national security law. Well, one that comes to mind is protective orders on discovery and who can see discovery and what the nature of the defense team is. Um, the first protective order I ever saw in a case was in the Embassy Bombings case, and now they're in every single criminal case. And what it does is it, 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 it precludes the defendant from being a participant in many respects in his own case because some discovery is walled off completely. Now I understand if it's you know, personal identifying information and it's an ID, and it's a, a ID theft case, that's logical. But when you're talking about statements of witnesses, and an ID of witnesses who are going to come and testify against someone, and he learns the weekend before the trial starts, he's not really being much help in his own case in the ability to do an investigation, to develop impeachment, all of those things. And this is endemic now in the system, in federal court, entirely. Secrecy is something that the prosecutors recognized very quickly was a tremendous tool and they expand it as much as possible. Anonymous juries, you know, it all, we started in organized crime cases, but in terms of secrecy by itself is a toxic element in the court system because it signals to judges and juries that this is really important and really dangerous. And unless you do it this way, we know stuff that you don't know, and you have to trust us with this. And what you wind up with is you know, the kind of wrongful convictions that are part of the fabric of today's life in a way that is, I mean, you want to talk about outrage. I mean, there are guys who are 40 years in jail who are getting released now, and, you know, good luck. You know. Other questions, comments? Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of talk from the panelists about um, the question of progress. Um, I feel like I'm the only human rights person who's looking at this with a silver lining, but do you feel that the legacy of this work, um, the impasse sort of, um, I mean, I, I understand where it's at with Guantanamo and Iraq and Afghanistan, but do you feel that the legacy of this work, all of your work, is perhaps the kind of bipartisan pressure that you're seeing on the Hill to avoid these similar mistakes in the newer situations like Yemen, with the push to create a review for US involvement in Yemen. So not more on the legal development, but early on to sort of nip it, nip the practice in the bud before it gets to that. So that's sort of the silver lining of it. Do you think it's naive to look at it that way? That I mean it's intense bipartisan pressure but really that you know came to fruition with the provisions in the defense budget earlier this year. But by the same token, is it also concerning you that the um, negative outcome or result of this legacy is that perhaps now that role in so-called in the so-called war on terror is being outsourced to other parties where the United States is sort of putting arm length up on these so-called terror suspects and it's being outsourced to parties with or states with more dubious human rights records like the UAE and the um, local forces that they back. Yes, 
Um, I, get, I, I think it, it's great to hear that there is a positive legacy and I'm comfortable with it, whatever the legacy is because you know, to me that's, uh, it, 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 it's hanging by a thread though in many respects I think in the context of what you say because we've institutionalized war and this goes back to Karen's original question about where are we, are we at the beginning, at the end, in the middle? I don't know where we are because we've institutionalized war, we've institutionalized conflict in a way that allows us to distance it so that so that we can't have accountability. So, so that what's happening in Yemen is just, it, 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 it's such a disaster, yet the concept of accountability is zero right now. And not only in the United States, but obviously in the countries that are doing it, but it's very frustrating because that has been normalized to the extent in which, and you don't even, I mean, you don't even see it. On a, you, I mean, you have to look back at the way the world was 20 years ago in the sense of the complete militarization of the society, um, whether it's police, whether it's football games, whether it's commercials on TV, whether it's, 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 it's pervasive. And to me, that is a, a considerable problem that, you know, I mean, like I say, the legacy is only, it, it, it requires constant state of vigilance and it, it, in this environment today, it's a, it's a very cha it's a very challenging uh, uh, program. So I just would say that um, I, I love that question. I don't I don't have an answer for it. I guess one positive thing is that no one has been brought to Guantanamo in quite a long time, right? And <coughs> two years of the Trump administration, and no one's been added to Guantanamo now. Is the administration taking people somewhere else? Are there secret prisons, right? Yeah, there are. <laughs> <There's> the <problem. laughs> Might not be managed by Americans, but that's the concern, right? So that would be right. a good part of my question. Right, so, but, you know, do we, you know, so is that, would it be better if those men were brought to Guantanamo than kept in secret prisons run by other entities? Um, or even the concern that you have the trials, um, and, and not just Yemen, you have also the situation going on with ISIS and Iraq and Syria and several Western countries refusing to even deal with all of their um, foreign nationals, suspects who are being arrested and held in Kurdish prisons. And nobody wants to even take the move of bringing them back to their countries for trial. So it's almost like an impasse before it even gets to the courts. And I can't tell if it's an outcome of what they've seen, the impasse of the Guantanamo trials and the 9-11 trials has been. Um, well, that's also when people saw an uptake in the use of drones, right? The theory was it, capturing someone is not is impossible, right? Because of all the issues around Guantanamo, right? So let's just kill them, right? Yeah. There was a fear, right, that that was sort of the backlash, right? I don't know, right? I think, you know, extrajudicial killings and uh, detention and interrogation by proxy you know, were certainly tools that were that the Bush administration considered to be on the table from the outset. Um, but the extent to which they relied on those tools and how that's fluctuated over time, um, definitely sort of what's happened in the Guantanamo litigation and how much friction and resistance there was on that front was probably a consideration, a factor among many. Uh, but frankly, there were probably a number of other considerations and factors that, that contributed to that decision on the Obama administration's part, for example, to rely far more heavily on um, extrajudicial killings than the Bush administration ever had, uh, and also the continuing decision by the Trump administration to double down on drones while also increasing its reliance on detention and interrogation by proxy, which you know the Bush era folks were doing, the Clinton era folks were doing before that, uh, you know, going back to the 90s, uh, but certainly Bush and Obama people were definitely resorting to those you know questionable methods. Um, you know that was an unintended consequence perhaps, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a different problem uh, that we have to get at using different tools. So US courts are not gonna be of great um, aid to anyone who is trying to 
for example, vindicate an interest not to be killed by a drone strike um, you know, overseas. I mean, we saw that in the Alwadi case. We've seen that in other cases that are still pending now. Uh, so that just means that you know, rights advocates and people who are concerned about, about these sorts of modes of participation in the world have to be more creative and find other ways to, to crack those problems. Because you know, I think even setting aside detention by proxy, the US military, under Obama's executive order, um, the, the order that has been described as uh, sort of the order banning torture, right? I mean, a close read of that executive order tells you that in fact what it did was it took the CIA out of the business of you know, long term detention, but you know, what is short term detention? That's left to the CIA's organization, <coughs> and they're certainly still engaged in that. There's been no information from anyone uh, on the CIA side confirming that they're, they're even out of short term detention. Not to mention special forces uh, detention facilities in places like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, where they are detaining people in 30 day renewable increments. Um, and, and where they claim the right not to give these people access to, certainly, I mean, I'm not even talking about lawyers, but access to the Red Cross is denied for you know, those, those 30 day periods, you know, as you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, those, are, those are definitely problems today. And, and it's going to take a great deal of creativity for advocates to figure out, okay, well, what do we want to do about that? Especially since it's proliferating as well. Other countries are now resorting to these same methods. Sure. Rick, last words. We're out of time. Yeah. So um, let me go back to where, where you began, which is the pendulum and where, where we are. And I <coughs> offer my own, it's both a belief and it's a hope, and in many ways they're inexplicably connected. Um, that the pendulum will swing back, but we don't know when. And um, I, I, I say that in part because we have seen other moments of oppression or injustice in 20th century history, which I've lived through, um, and things actually improved. Um, just to give you a, a couple of examples, I, I was too young to experience the McCarthy Red Scares, but I remember them, and I remember reading about them, and that kind of visceral anti-communism is a thing of the past, and it was a thing of the past long before 89 and the fall of the most of the communist regime. I'll give you one other example. Um, the most dramatic change in moral vision and practice in my lifetime has been the uh, transformation of attitudes to gays and lesbians. We're just universally reviled throughout much of my adulthood and are not today. I'm not suggesting we are living in a paradise, but the, the kind of, again, visceral homophobia that was virtually universal throughout much of the 20th century is now largely gone. So I have to believe that this is an aberration, but it may take a long time. And yes, um, the, the various wars, the war on terror, the war on drugs before it, prohibition before that, contaminate our legal system in profound ways. But, but, but there are antidotes, and just to go back to your, your point, the, 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 the cliche quote, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Um, these fights have to be fought, and it be fought forever, uh, without seeing a clear outcome, because one has to keep up. Probably a good note to end it on. I was going to say something else, but I think um, I, um, there is one thing I will say, which is that 10 years ago, when I was having one of these panels, I guess at NYU then, um, I remember thinking, somebody, um, Vicky, you know, somebody should write a book about the lawyers and what they've been through and what's happened to them over the course of time through these Cases. So I'm just suggesting, because you said you don't have a book. Um, but it's been quite an odyssey. And um, thank you for bringing so much of it to, to life for us. And thank you for coming. Oh, and for signing books. If you're really strong, you can buy these books. <laughs>